Okay, so uh, let's get started with the prayer, and we will jump into it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have not left us without an answer on subjects like this. Uh, although it may be difficult to mine things out in certain ways and in certain ways, Lord, this is an important subject, and it's not one that we should take lightly. It's not one that I know these students take lightly. I, I know when I was their age, this was something that I battled with, I struggled with all the way into college. And to be honest, we all struggle with this question from time to time, sometimes every day. Lord, I ask that you bring solace and you bring comfort and you bring guidance uh, and compassion to the to the heart that's in this room or who watches online who just doesn't know what to do. And they don't know how to make sense of their life and they don't know how to make sense of what you've called them to do or what you've asked them to do in your word. And I ask that you clarify those things through your word and through my mouth uh, that I would not get in the way this evening and that you would come to your sheep and that you would feed them with your word. And that you would glorify yourself. I ask that these things be crystal clear by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so there's probably no more discussion that we've ever had in here. I'm not going to say it's more important. I think last week's was extremely important. But there's probably not a discussion we've had in this room that is more practical. That is more applicational to your life. And I hope that you leave thinking that. And I hope that that's reflected in your feedback at the end with the QR code. I want you to understand this question when I did college ministry, and I did college ministry for you guys who don't know that for about two years at FBC. Uh, and I struggled with this question. And not only did I struggle, I had a bunch of college students who were 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and they struggled with this question. So out the gate, the question of what is God's will for my life? Be honest. Show of hands. You're not on camera. Have you ever asked yourself that question? Raise your hand if you have. Raise your hand if this is a question that's frequent in your mind. You may not say it out loud. You may not ask other people, but it's something you think about often. I, first of all, I, there may be pastors that would stand here and, and chastise you for that, and I, I don't want to do that. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's warranted. I understand why you ask that question. If you didn't ask that question, it would be more concerning. Because then you would have... Can you repeat it? Have you ever asked yourself the question, what is God's will for my life? And ha have you ever asked yourself that question often? Is that an often question that you... Exactly, right? So, thank you guys for being honest. Now, the thing that I want to highlight for you is if you didn't ask yourself, what is God's will for my life? I would be more concerned in some ways. Because it would mean you don't care. This is a question that troubles students. If, if, before we jump in, could you tell me what's troubling about this to you? Why is this such a complicated or convoluted topic in your mind? What, what is it about this that's so mysterious? Because it is, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not a trick question. It is seemingly mysterious. So what is it? What is it, right? Absolutely. She's, I hope you heard what she said. She was speaking kind of low. I hope you heard what she said. The world's telling you one thing. You don't know if that's God, if that's God's will. You don't know if that's in line with the word of God. Um, that is absolutely accurate. Anybody else before we jump in? Jace, what you got? It's a question if you're wondering if you're a good person or a bad person. Okay, you can ask yourself the question of what is God's will for my life. Because you want to be a good person who's in line with God's will. You don't want to be a bad person or an evil person or a sinful person, right? I mean, exactly right, Jace. Good answer. Anybody else? Molly? Um, that you want to make the right decision. Yeah, you, and you, go ahead. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Okay. I was going to say you want to make the right decision and you want to make sure you're going on the right path that God wants you to go. Yes, yes. And that, that's something that I'm going to try to address tonight is. So I saw a picture on Facebook today. My friend um, shared it, and it made me think of tonight. This is my illustration. There was a highway in China, and it has 50 lanes, five zero lanes on this highway, 50 lanes across. And it was a picture of those 50 lanes and cars in each of those lanes. You know, there are like 2 billion people live in that country. And 
miles down the road, those 50 lanes turn into four. Which means 46 of those lanes have to merge into what becomes four. And I thought, man, is that not exactly like our view of God's will for our life? There's so many options. There's so many lanes. There's so many places we can be. And odds are I'm not in the right lane. And I'm not in the right lane to get off on one of those four exit ramps to take me to my goal. College. You know, you guys who are up there heading towards senior year, heading towards college, that, that can be terrifying, if we're being honest. That can be, what school do I go to? What major do I pick? What career should I aim for? What person should I date? What person should I marry? We're talking about a super important question. Person should I marry? What church should I go to? What friends should I hang out with? Hey, then it comes to, should I, should I go over there? Should I go over here? You start to question every single detail of your life if you're not careful. And you start to scrutinize it and say, I don't know. And you become petrified with fear. Ever been there? Ever been so terrified of doing the wrong thing that you did nothing? Absolutely. Certainly myself included. It has been said that the greatest challenge in the world is knowing what God wants. Why? Why? Because he doesn't show up in a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire and tell you audibly. He doesn't come down in a column of smoke into your bedroom while you're watching TikTok, Jaylee, and say, Jaylee, I don't want you to be friends with so-and-so anymore. It's not Moses at Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. It's not Jesus in the flesh in front of us, although oftentimes, if we're honest, we wish that he was with us, so he could tell us exactly what to do and how we are to behave. But I don't think the Word of God has left us unaware on this answer. Now, this, I'm going to be honest, this is a really difficult message for me to prepare. I told Keaton this uh, until I told Lana this. Lana today in Dragon Time asked me, um, How many pages do you have, Mr. Wyndham? And I said, uh, A page and a half. Now, Lana, I'm happy to report I have 12 now. Okay, so I've made progress since I spoke to you last. Okay? Now, here are a couple of statistics for you. Only 48% of U.S. adults believe that God determines what happens to them most or all of the time. Only 48%. Only 42% of Americans believe that God hears prayers and can intervene. Only 42% of Americans believe that God hears prayers and can intervene in your life. It's not so much that he hears them, the part that bothers me, it's that they don't think he can do anything about them that bothers me. So, if you notice on our handouts, I put lines on there because I didn't have verses to go through. I just have lines now for you to add to, and if you want to use your own notes, you're welcome to do that, of course. So, God has two kinds of wills. That's the first place to start. Okay? God has two kinds of wills. Okay? He has a sovereign will, number one. You guys who are writing, I would write this down. God has a sovereign will, which is a will that is the fabric of reality. Okay? This is the will by which God decrees, the will by which he ordains all things that come to pass. So the easiest way for you to think about the sovereign will of God is it's the will that makes up reality. Everything that is, ultimately, is the secret or sovereign will of God. And you need to understand there are two different types. Because if you don't, things are going to not make sense when you read the Bible. There's the sovereign or the secret will of God. This is where he doesn't tell you his plan. Don't you wish he would tell you his plan? Don't you wish, Mr. Jones, I was asking him what he thought about this subject this morning. I was asking I've asked quite a few people and... I asked him what he thought about this, and the only thing he really said was, it's a blessing that God doesn't tell us his will for our life, because if we did, we would be so terrified of what was coming down the road that we'd never do anything. And I think that's a good point. So there's the secret or the sovereign will of God, and that's the will that determines reality itself. It's the will that makes up everything that you see happen. Nothing happens, as Jesus said, I told you three weeks ago. Not a sparrow falls to the ground outside of your father's will. There is 
Not one blade of grass that dies outside of his ordination or his decreeing. This is a sovereign king over all things. And far from making you uncomfortable, that should make you comforted. That God is in control of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Number two, God has a revealed will. So number one is a secret will. Number two is the revealed will. Let me ask you a question just to see if you get bonus points here. What, where do you find the revealed will of God? Where do you go find that? you find it on the farmer's almanac or in the stars? Where do you find that? Say it again, Bill. Okay, very good. Less attitude, but very good. Great answer. Okay? I'm just messing it up. So, uh, the Bible. That, that, I'm so proud of you that, that the youth ministry that I'm in charge of, that's your answer. Because that is the right answer. If you want to know what God thinks about something, you don't need to consult a ritual. You don't need to consult the stars and astrology. You don't need to look deep within yourself to find the inner God, as some people within Christianity teach. You don't need to go out and go on a big pilgrimage to find out what God wants you to do. You go to the Word of God. Very good, brother. Thank you for holding that. Now, There are four points tonight that I want to walk you through. It takes 11 pages, but there are four points I want to walk you through. Okay? Hope you have your Wheaties. Now, there are four places I found specifically in the New Testament that say verbatim, this is the Lord's will for you. Straight up. Four verses. And I unpack those in, like I said, 11 pages. Now, number one, no, don't, I'm not pulling punches, so don't, don't throw tomatoes at me, okay? I'm going to try to answer these as best oh, I can. Yeah. But before you, under, before you jump to a conclusion, remember, God didn't tell you, should I go to Taco Bell or McDonald's? That's not, you might believe you're getting an impression or the Holy Spirit is guiding or leading you or, for example, a car cuts you off when you're about to turn into Taco Bell and you decide, oh, wait, that's my sign to go to McDonald's, there might be that, okay? But when it comes to the choices in your life, they're going to be built upon principles out of the Word of God, not, I'm not going to leave here and tell you who you should date. I'm not going to give you an answer for that. I can't, I can't do that. I can't find it in the Word of God. It's not a magic eight ball. You might want to jot that down. The Bible is not a magic eight ball. Some of you guys don't know what that is. It's a shame. Yes, sir. I'll get them just. Okay, thank you. I actually, I'm using some of those. So, great job, Robert. Okay, the Bible is not a magic eight ball. Okay? Number one, God's will for your life is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's will for your life is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 6 40. Is our scripture reference. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes on Him shall have eternal life. Now follow my logic here. It is impossible for someone to be doing the will of God revealed in Scripture if they are not saved and do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm arguing from the opposite here. Okay, What I'm telling you is it's not possible for you to be doing what God wants you to do if you do not believe and are not saved. Evelyn. What was the verse? John 6, 40. Does that make sense? So the will of God is that all men should repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. So if you're not doing that, then you're violating his ultimate will for your life. That means every sinner running around, and I mean unrepentant sinner, running around in the world that you bump shoulders with every day, they don't have the right, and I want you to hear me say this, they don't have the right to ask what God's will is for their life. Because God's will for their life starts with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? So the first requisite to knowing God's will, prerequisite, would be believing in his son. Now, if you're here, you check that box. So 
Got the green light on one. Let's check the other three. And I'm going to work, work through this. So it is impossible to know God's will and not know God. Seems pretty self-evident. This is like someone who does not know someone else. Knowing what they like and what they desire, it doesn't happen. Jaylee was talking to me about track earlier, and she said a couple of names of people that I didn't know. And I asked her last name. And if I were to insinuate or assume certain things about Jaylee's friends, I would be wrong because I don't know them. Right now, if she said, you know, Abigail or Faith or some of the kids I've taught, I know them. I've spent nine months with them. I I know about them. I know some of their likes and their dislikes and things like that. And I I know kind of about their life and about them. But if I don't know someone, how can I know what they desire? And certainly, how can I know what they desire about me for my life? I can tell you what my mom and dad desire for my life. Even if I disagree with it, I can tell you what I think they want because they have a relationship with me. Right? But if I walk up to a random stranger at Wingstop and say, what is your will for my life? He's going to say, I don't know you, bro. Back up. But do you want a 10-piece or an 8-piece or what? I don't know him. Right? Do you follow my logic here? It's, it's very simple. It's important to note that we know God's will in our life because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as believers. And we are feasting on the Word of God itself. We should recognize that the will of God is not something that you do. I hope you hear me when I say this. It's going to rattle some of your cages. We should recognize that the will of God is not something that we do, or something that we spend time on, or something that you go find. We always feel like we have to go find the will of God for our life. That's why we go a lot of... It's a cliche, but that's why a lot of college students go backpacking through Europe. They're constantly trying to find themselves and in the process of trying to find God's will for their life. The will of God is a person. I'm going to say that again. The will of God is a person. And his name is Jesus. So that was painless. Number two way to know God's will for your life is be sanctified. Number two is be sanctified. Scripture references 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It is God's will for you that you be sanctified. That's what that verse says. There's more to it, talking about sexual immorality and purity and stuff like that, but I left all that out because the point is be sanctified. Do you know what that word means? To be, you got it? First Thessalonians 4, 3. One T H E S four three. Now, yes, sir. To be sanctified kind of means to be cleansed. Okay, I like that. Good answer. Anybody else want to add anything? Sanctified. When someone's saying I'm being sanctified, sanctification is the process that you undergo throughout your whole Christian life, where the Holy Spirit makes you more like Jesus Christ, makes you makes you holy in practice. Not just in position. Okay? More and more holy. Now, secondly, the will of God looks like you being conformed to the image of His Son. This means that His goal for you is not just you being saved. It is that through the process of sanctification, you begin to look more like His Son and behave and think and talk like Jesus. Verse, well here's a reference for you. Ready, Evelyn? Romans 8, 29. Romans 8.29 For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. A simple question, I want you to listen carefully here. So I put this in bold, so I, the, the, the past me of about five hours ago thought this was important. So, a simple question to ask yourself would be this. Is what I'm doing, how I'm living, What I'm watching, what I'm listening to, what I'm reading, who I'm around, what I'm saying, and what I'm believing in, making me more like Jesus. All of those things, are they making you more like Jesus, or are they making you less like him? 
that's a good acid test for you to ask yourself, am I doing the will of God? Because the will of God is that you be sanctified and conformed to the image of His Son. Meaning, that you can rest pretty certain and confident that if what you're doing and saying and reading and speaking and who you spend time around and what you're believing is making you more like Jesus Christ, it's the will of God. You understand my point? Fairly certain I'm not seeing a lot of confirmation here. If we're going to be serious about finding the will of God, we must be willing to understand that God is not so much concerned with what you do as he is who you are. God is not so much concerned with what you do as he is who you are. God cares more about who you are than what you do. So, spoiler alert on some of this, because I know some of y'all are already feeling it. I'm not going to give you a hard and fast concrete answer, as I said a little bit ago. And some of what I'm going to say is going to sound dangerous, because I'm going to end up at a point tonight where I say, as long as they're not violating these four principles, go do whatever it is that God has called you to do. Go do whatever it is that the door is open in front of you. Walk through it. You understand? I'm not, I'm not telling you it's right or left, red or green, casting a dice or, you know, magic eight ball. It's none of that. It's not mystical. I'm telling you that, and I've told college students this, not this well put together, but I've told college students this. The will of God for you is about your soul. It's not about where you go. The will of God always involves eternal things. Now, don't hear me say some of y'all need to hear this tonight. Don't hear me say that God doesn't care about what friends you have. He does. He cares a lot. God doesn't care about your pain and your suffering. That is a lie from the devil. That God doesn't care about the struggles that you have inside of your own mind, and your own life, physically, emotionally. He does. He cares greatly about those things. Supremely. He cares more than you. I hope anxiety talked three weeks ago helped you understand that. He cares way more about you than you care about you. Believe me. He's an infinite person. He has an infinite capacity to love you. I hope you hear that. I hope your heart hears that. He cares about everything in your life. Every last detail. Every hair on your head. Every sparrow that falls to the ground. He cares. But what I'm saying is, when the revealed will of God, and you're applying it, and you're taking these principles, and you're walking through them, and you're applying them to your life, you don't have to be worried about, oh my gosh, am I going to make the wrong choice? You walk through the door that's in front of you, and you know that God is going to take care of you. Because that's what good and loving fathers do. He said, he said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you good gifts who ask him? God's aim and goal in your salvation is not just to save you for all of eternity, but to reproduce his Son in you. We have the wrong idea in our heads that salvation is about us, when salvation has always been about Christ in Scripture. We believe so strongly in our culture that finding the will of God is something we go and discover and something we do. The truth is, God doesn't want you to be like you or to be true to yourself. I know some of you have been told this before. He's not interested in you being more like you. You are the problem. He's interested in you being like His Son. He's interested that when you go and you talk to people and you pray with people and you listen to people and you talk about scripture and you talk about God that they see Jesus in you. That's his will for your life, that you be sanctified. Making Ephesians 1, 9, Lord, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. The last part of that verse. His purpose is set in Christ. If you want to know God's will, look hard in the face of Jesus. 
God has been pleased to tell you that which used to be a mystery for all ages before this, according to Ephesians 1, 9, I just read you. You have the will of God revealed to you in Christ. You know what others have not known. You know his plans. This means that God has found it pleasing to him for you to know his plans and what he desires. He's not left you unaware. He's told you his plan. In times past, God has revealed his moral character through the law, his plans through the prophets. But now in Christ, he has revealed his heart through the gospel. What was hidden has now been made known. Hebrews 1, Evelyn, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Colossians 1, 25 through 27. I'm trying to give you a bunch of verses to, to store and look back on. Colossians 1, 25 through 27. I'm just going to read verse 27. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you is a mystery that was not revealed in all of the Old Testament. I just want to make sure you stop and understand what I'm saying. Nowhere from Genesis to Malachi did the Old Testament prophets or Moses ever see that the Holy Spirit would come and permanently dwell inside of believers. Never saw it. It was never prophesied. It was a mystery until it happened. And now that mystery is in you. And now you have God dwelling in you. Mystery. Solved. In sum, in Christ is all the wisdom. And because we are in Christ, we have full access to the wisdom and will of God. Christ is the mystery hidden in ages past. To put it another way, the will of God for you is that Christ dwelling in you will transform you into his likeness. Anything or anyone that stands in the way of what is God's will for you and anything and anyone that aids in the process can be viewed as being in line or revealed the will of God. Again, ask yourself the question. Start scrutinizing the things in your life. Ask yourself, is my best friend somebody who makes me more like Christ? Or are they standing in the way of that? Now you'll start to ask yourself, but for example... If you were to come to me and say, hey, I've got a new boyfriend, hey, I've got a new girlfriend, um, do you think this is good for me? Do you think this is God's will for my life? I would, if I was being honest, and I always try to be, I would ask you a question like this. Well, is that relationship making you more like Christ? And you would probably say yes, even if that's not true. And, and then I would ask you other follow-up questions that would go something like this. Well, we, we know the revealed will of God is, like 1 Thessalonians 4, it's to abstain from sexual immorality. Is that something you're engaging in? Is that something that you're doing with this boyfriend or this girlfriend? If you say yes, the answer is very clearly, obviously, that's not the will of God that you are involved in. That. Right? You may not like to hear that, and you may think it's a little forward, but you're asking me, and you guys who know me, you know I'm going to tell you the truth. So this last one, I'm gonna tell you the truth. So, do you understand my point? You know, if you if you, if you bring somebody in, in the back of your mom's car on Wednesday night, you've got them tied up in the trunk, and afterwards you're gonna go take a pickaxe to them. And Evelyn says, and she's over there laughing. She says, "Hey, this one, do you think it's God's will? This person is a bad person. They hurt kids. Do you think it's God's will for my life that I go and take a pickaxe to them and rid the world of this terrible person?" Well. I'll go to Exodus 20 and I'll say, Thou shalt not murder. And so, no, Evelyn, that's not the will of God. Now, does he deserve it? Yeah, absolutely he deserves it. But the Lord said he will avenge and he will be the judge. You're not that, right? You're not there. So, do you get my point? 
So we, we can very easily start to ask ourselves questions that are just uncomfortable. When we start to say, is that something I should do? My teacher gave me an F. Should I tell him bleepity bleep, blankety blank? Okay, should I show them this finger in the middle? <laughs> well, respect your elders or your mom and dad, for example. This is a big one that comes up. How should I relate to my mom and dad? My mom is a vicious, brutal, overbearing mama bear. My mom is... The devil, Mr. Wyndham, Taylor, you, you, you don't know her. She is Satan with heels. Well, the New Testament talks over and over, and the Old Testament, about honoring your father and mother. If you think that's bad, it even says in certain places like Philemon, slaves obey your masters. Um, come under the authority in Romans 13 of the government. So the point is, the will of God is that you submit to authority figures even if you don't like them. That's the will of God. You might not like me to say that, but that's true. I'm going to go out to drink tonight, Taylor. What if I had too many? Well, the Bible doesn't condemn drinking, but it does condemn drunkenness. What's your intention? What are you doing? There are verses that talk about these things. Now, there, it's true that there are tons of verses like in Leviticus that talk about the Old Covenant and talk about not moral laws, but ceremonial laws and, and things like that, like tattoos and plenty of other things, right, that, that don't necessarily apply to us today, but you know what moral laws are. You're not dumb. In the New Testament, when it says, do not do this, do this, it's very clear. You understand my point? Yes or no? So no pickaxes. I'm sorry. No. Aww. The will of God for the life. Yeah, the will of God for the life of a Christian is that he she be salt and light in the world. Matthew five, verse forty eight says, "Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy." Okay, we're called to be salt and light. Salt makes things better. Salt makes things savory. Salt means that we as Christians are meant to make the world a better place. Are you doing that? So many Christians are consumed with questions concerning what they should be doing and how it lines up with the will of God. And yet so many Christians, hear me carefully, never ask themselves if their words and actions and beliefs spur them on towards greater holiness in their practice. In other words, we get so worried about what we should be doing that we're not concerned at all with what our life looks like. Maybe before you go out and try to change the world, maybe to use Jordan Peterson's term, you should make your bed. Maybe you should clean your room. Maybe you should handle your own life and your own moral imperfections. Maybe you should apply scripture to that rough area and smooth it out. Maybe, maybe you should work on further sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit and the application of the Word of God to first bring you into conformity before you wag your finger at the dying, onlooking world. Maybe you should clean stuff up in your own heart before you go and try to change the world. And I'm not saying don't change the world. I think you can do it. He's in you. You can do it. He's the only one who's ever changed the world. And you've got to you got him, baby. You've got everything you need. I just told you that last week. you got everything you need. But what you need is to look, talk, walk, and act just like him. That's what you need. Be sanctified. The question we can ask ourselves, when people watch me speak and act, do I remind them of Jesus? When people look at me, do I remind them of Jesus? Or... Do I remind them of a spoiled brat desperately trying to seek blessing and positivity from a father that I want nothing to do with, like in Luke 15, the prodigal son? Because of your commitment to personal obedience and holiness, do people feel the same way about you? This, this question, when I wrote it, even though it came from my brain, when I wrote it, I sat back in my creaky, rickety, ratchet chair. Jay was like, I hate that thing. I don't miss that thing at all. So, 
It is. And, and then y'all make fat jokes, so here we are back and back. So, there's that. Don't be fat, Shane. Thank you, Robert. Look, I did gain 10 pounds in the last month, okay? <laughs> okay, so, here's a question. I want to make sure you hear it. You may want to even jot it down. Okay. Do people feel the same way about you as they did with Christ? Do the same people that hated him hate you also? Do the same people that loved him love you also? Do you act and talk and walk and live just like him so much that you remind them of him? I want to tell you something that you might not want to exactly hear, but if the people who absolutely hated Jesus love you, there may be a problem there. And yeah, let's address the elephant in the room. Most of those people were religious types, religious, self-righteous Pharisees. They were people who thought they were better than other people. That's one of the things that I love about our youth group is that as far as I can tell, we don't feel that we're better than other people. Hopefully we all remember we're just saved sinners just like everybody else. But if the people who hated Jesus love you, maybe you should have some self-reflection. This will be my Bible. Okay. When it comes to God's will for your life, we should be much more concerned about whether we reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest compliment that someone can give you is that they say they can tell that you have been with and you are now with Jesus Christ. No. At the end of Matthew, I already, I already addressed that one. Okay. Wherever you find yourself in whatever circumstances, positive or negative, bring glory to Christ by showing people Him. The old saying, and I know you've heard this, you are the only Bible some people will ever read. It's true. And you are the only Christ some people will ever see. What a reminder. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, since God's mercy, we have this ministry. We do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Number three, daily. Very simple. God's will for your life is that you give thanks in everything. That you give thanks in everything. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is that reference. Notice this verse does not say give thanks in all good circumstances. This verse says all circumstances, and all means all. Just like no means no. This means that giving thanks in everything requires a view of God that takes into account his sovereign and omnipotent control of all the circumstances of your life. Not just that he is in charge or that he permits all things, but rather that he ordains and decrees all things that come to pass. Now I have here a list of Bible verses. I'm going to read them. And I'm going to give you the references. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to comment on them. I'm just going to read them. Okay? This, these verses are all about the sovereignty of God. And this is important to understand for, for giving thanks. Proverbs 19.21. Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. What a verse. Job 42.42. 42. I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in the heavens, and he does as he pleases. Amen. Ephesians 1, 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, 
who works all things together according to the counsel of his will. Psalm 135.6. I love these verses. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. Whatever he pleases. Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. I'm going to read that again because I don't think you understood that. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he pleases. Proverbs 16.9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I hope you believe these verses. I really do. Daniel 4.35, by the way, the context of this verse, so you understand the weight of it, is when Nebuchadnezzar, after losing his mind for seven years, seven years, he went mad. He was a wild animal running around with a long beard and body hair, naked, roaming around in the wilderness, and God gave him his mind back. And this is what he says. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted for as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can hold his hand or say to him, What have you done? Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning. Listen to these, this verse carefully. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Declaring the end from the beginning. Genesis 50, 20. Some of you know this verse. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Just so you understand that verse. He's saying that when you cast a dice, what it lands on, the Lord determines which side of the dice it lands on. Something as simple and profound and meaningless. He cares about that too. Think about that. If you get snake eyes, he did that. Isaiah 45, 7. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Isaiah 45. Okay, uh, so all these things are meant to indicate the same thing. Namely, that everything that happens to you and I is ordained and decreed by God. If you start to view life as everything that happens to you, good and bad, coming from the hand of a loving Father who is using all things according to Romans 8.28 for your good and for his glory, then you can give thanks in all things. This does not simply mean that God employs or weaponizes all bad things in your life that were brought about by the devil to benefit you and turn them towards your good. It means that he orchestrated all things, including the evil and the sin, from all of eternity past to be used for your good. Genesis 50, 20. I've already read that one. When people quote this verse, they almost always mean what evil people and what the devil meant for evil towards them is somehow co-opted and used by God for your good. This verse does not mean that it means that the same evil intention that the world of the devil has for your life, God has proposed forever that the same deed would bring about your good. This is two sides of the same coin. On the one side, we have an evil agent or a character acting to hurt you. And on the other side of the same coin, we have God ordaining terrible and wicked evils to bring about your good and your thankfulness. Now, I'm going to say something. I want to make sure you hear it. There are things in God's secret will that don't line up with his revealed will. So let me put it a different way. God can ordain things in his secret will 
that he does not approve of. Now, if you don't believe me, Acts 4, Acts 2, multiple places in Acts, it says that God ordained the brutal slaughter and killing of his son. Do you think God enjoyed that? No. Was that against God's revealed will to put God in the flesh on the tree and kill him? Absolutely. But was it something that God ordains for the salvation of sinners like me and you? Absolutely. God can ordain something that he does not approve of. And I think it's important you understand that. The will of God for your life is that you demonstrate that Christ is satisfactory and sufficient in all of life's circumstances, both good and bad, or put another way, that your thankfulness doesn't depend on your circumstances, but rather that you are content in Christ. And well, before we move to point four, it'd be this. In Christ, by being thankful, you demonstrate that Christ is worthy, more worthy than all of the circumstances around you. Number four, here's your final point. Submit and do what is right. Submit and do what is right. And silence the foolish talk of ignorant people. Submit and do what is right. And silence the foolish talk of ignorant people. First Peter 2.15 For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. The final point about knowing the will of God for your life is simple. And that is that God wills for your life that you obey his word. God wills for your life that you obey his word. God's desire to put a bow on all four of these statements is that after you are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are sanctified to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And to demonstrate his worthiness and satisfaction to the world, that you then demonstrate your obedience as a true slave to Jesus Christ. He is your master, and you're his slave. To put it another way, the desire and goal of the Lord and will for your life is that through your actions and your deeds, you represent him in a way that silences the talk of people who blaspheme and reject him. It can be done. I met with a guy last week who's an atheist. And we talked for over three hours. Three hours. And we did it respectfully, and we did it kindly, and we disagreed the whole time. I told him he was wrong every ten minutes. Just so you understand, you're dead wrong. And I would tell him that, and then I would ask him, have I been disrespectful to you? No, not at all. But please understand that the way that you live and the way you obey the word of God can silence the mouth of people who desire to blaspheme and reject him. It, it is up to you, just so you understand, it is up to you whether you bring reproach and shame upon the name of Christ. We all know Christians who do, right? We all see people on TV. If you just send me $200, I'll send you an arm bone of John the Baptist that's been blessed and it'll give you a miracle. And we see... People all the time, ladies and gentlemen, who are bad representations of Christ. Right? Yes? Will we be honest? It's up to you. Do you want to shut the mouths of the accusers and bring honor and glory to the name of Christ? Or do you want to be the reason that they spit when someone mentions the name of Jesus? We're going... There you go. In simplest terms, it means that you are to act out in obedience to the revealed will of God as shown and demonstrated in the word of God as much as possible. We're going to be his representatives and his ambassadors. We must represent him with what we have been given and what he has revealed to us. Think about it this way. If God had wanted us to know the answer to everything that we should ever do, moment by moment, he would have created a walkie-talkie to heaven or a telephone system. But instead, he has simplified it in a manner so as we understand what his heart is in the word of God. That second option would be atheist. 
You may ask yourself how it is that we are to obey the law. I don't know if you know this, but the law in the Old Testament has 613 commandments. Remember, James said if you're guilty of breaking one part, you're guilty of breaking all of it. So if you violate one commandment, and you've done a bunch of that today, you probably just don't know it. If you violate one commandment, you're guilty of breaking it all, and the soul that sins shall surely die. So how would we go about obeying the moral law of God? Jesus has given us an answer to that question. What is the point of the law if it brings only death? Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew, you, you definitely want to take this with you. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. I love that part. They said, all right, fine, we'll take a crack at it. Sadducees didn't work. All right, here we go. Let's reload. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with his question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Do you know what Jesus' answer is before I read it? Anybody remember? You really need to know this, so I hope you hear me. Jesus replied, and I put it in bold. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Verse 39, and the second is like it. Does anybody know the second greatest commandment? If you do, say it out loud. Love your neighbor as yourself. Very good. Sam said it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen to this next part. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, you can take 613 commandments that God gave the Jewish people and sum them up into two lines. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you are doing those two things, you are doing the will of God. That sums up the whole law. But notice Jesus said something that's really difficult. Love him with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your strength and with all of your soul. Now, do we fail to meet that commandment every day? Yes, absolutely. But understand that commandment is made up in love. So if you are going to love people, you're going to have to love God that way first. And then you will obey the law and you will be in perfect harmony with the will of God. The secret sauce, if you will, about living a life that's worthy of the gospel and one that is obedient to the will of God is that we love him with all that we have. The truth remains that when we are saved according to the will of God, we are sanctified according to the will of God. We magnify Jesus through thanksgiving in all things, and we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and therefore love our neighbors as ourselves. We will be in the will of God. Let me remind you, before I close here in a second, if you haven't already done so, take a, a snap, a screen, uh, tag in a picture of the QR code. Fill that out for me. It's going to take you a little bit longer than normal, so go ahead and do that. The last real thing I have to say is this as you're, as you're doing that. Last, last line is this. Christ is the will of God. As you seek to exalt and be just like him, you will be obedient to the will of God. You will be doing. Remember, the will of God, students, is not a friend. It's not a job. It's not a career. It's not a grade at school. The world tells you that. Heck, the church tells you that. That's not true. I'm telling you that you can be free from all of those things that terrorize you and keep you up at night about the choices that you make, about the things and the decisions that you make. You guys filling that out for me? Jace, you got a phone? No. Okay. So you can be free from that is my point. I know I didn't tell you. I know you leave and you come up here at the end and say, tell you, you didn't tell me what, what college I'm supposed to go to. No, you're right, I didn't. I didn't do that. But what I can do is tell you that if you obey these four principles, the outline, the will of God, be saved, be sanctified, be giving thanks always, and be obedient to the revealed word of God, you will be acting in line 
with the true secret will of God that you're never going to know. You probably never will know in heaven. Even one day you may not know all of that. That grand tapestry of the infinite choices of all of humans all at once. But you can rest assured that God is working out all of those things. Not only to the counsel of his will, but according to his good pleasure. And for your good. And for his glory. Okay? You know, keep filling it out. Any questions before we close? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray and I, I beg that you would bind this, whatever was good in this tonight, that you would bind it to the heart of these students and that they would truly believe that the will of God is not something uh, supernatural or mysterious or um, somehow mystical, but Lord, that we would see from your word that we can know your will. We can walk in lockstep and not quench the spirit and we can know by your word and that's the key that we can know who you are and what you desire of us by your word father i ask that you give an insatiable itch an insatiable hunger for these students that they would know and bury their head and bury their heart in the word of god lord that that would be true of every student in this room and that you nag at them until that's true about their life let them leave changed. Let them leave reflective. Let the foolishness of the world and the flesh of the devil not snatch away the word that you have sown in their hearts. Lord, thank you that you are faithful to your word and it doesn't return to you, boy. Thank you for these students. I love them. I pray that you bring them back, Lord, that the, the will of God will be demonstrated very clearly in their minds. And they would remember exactly who they are this week as they go be salt and light in the world. Thank you for them. And bless them in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, remember to bring the extra papers and the pens up on the counter. And if you are in this room and I do not have your shirt size, you need to come up here and tell me.